This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God, read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue laying the foundation with Book 1. In Chapter 6, this is Section 18. Touching on Teaching and Learning Friend, Does it happen very often that someone sincerely goes into the course, works through the whole book and then says, been there, done that, and walks away? It seems like it would change your thinking so much. How could you walk away and say, I do not need to work on it anymore? David This revolves around what Jesus calls transfer of training. The ego can learn the course and then compartmentalize it in the mind so it can just talk the course, which would be a defense against applying it. The ego says, do not apply it. Do not start looking at the various aspects of your life because that would literally bring about an experience of awakening. The message of the Course is so simple and so direct that people will often attempt to fit the Course into their life instead of letting go of what they conceive as of their life. and just letting go to the Holy Spirit. What happens is people try to mix the course with all sorts of different things. This can be another diffusing mechanism. I do not want to really hear what it is saying. I do not want to really see what it is saying. So I interpret against it. But there can be a genuine experience with the Course if the mind is ready and willing to use it. At the end of the workbook, Jesus says, Our use for words is almost over now. Workbook Part 2 If the mind is really open and ready, it can approach mysticism where it sinks more and more into that quietness. It sinks more and more into the revelatory experience and then, for a period of time, it seems to come back into the world until it does not come back. It just sinks into the light And that is it. People can say, I took that course. But the course has such a depth and is so profound that it is rare that someone seems to come in and just go through it. We need to step back and see that even taking a course in miracles is not a choice that the mind really has. At the very introduction, Jesus says that only the time you take this course is up to you. Even the form is not up to you. In the ultimate sense, here is the world and here is the screen and here is where a course in miracles is on the screen. It is all about my mind's readiness and willingness to turn back to the light beyond the screen of the world. As I do that, purely in a mind sense, it will seem like there is a form going on out here. I seem to be a person with a book with eyes moving over the pages. 
All of that is out there on the screen and is just a symbol. Really, I am a mind and I am coming back to the light. There just seems to be form. It is symbolic. That really gets away from defending the course. You begin to see that it is seemed to be a path a person was taking. But really, it was just another symbol. That brings such joy. I do not have to get into defending the course or worrying about 60 minutes ever doing an expose on it. I do not have to get into that because all that is out there on the screen. What I do need to do is watch my mind. Jesus says that being a miracle worker does not have anything to do with how long you have been in it. But it has to do with your willingness and readiness. Ultimately, he says, to trust implicitly in his readiness. You cannot really trust in your own readiness. Friend, that teacher within us, right? It is not a teacher out there. David, yes, it is to be seen as symbolic. In the Manual for Teachers, there is a section about levels of teaching. Jesus begins the section by saying that there are no levels or progressions of teaching. God's plan for atonement was accomplished in an instant. But Jesus knows that idea is too big a quantum leap. So he goes on to offer three levels. He talks about the casual encounters, sustained relationships and lifelong teaching-learning relationships. In the Song of Prayer, he also talks about rungs of a ladder as a metaphor for going deeper with the teachings. He begins the manual for teachers by saying that you are teaching and learning every instant. That takes it out of a realm of form, of teacher or student appearing. If you are teaching every instant, then it is all in your mind. There are two thought systems in there. I am teaching myself depending on which one I am lining up with every instant. I always go back to that. That is how I keep it simple every instant. I do not have to think about who the teacher is for me or who the student is. Actually, most of the manual for teachers is written at the relative or metaphorical level. He talks about healers and patients, but in the ultimate sense, our minds are what need healing. He does not give he does give a sense that there will be some who seem to have trained their minds or will seem to be a little bit more miracle minded. It is described as a teacher-pupil or healer-patient relationship. He is clearly talking at the metaphorical level of how it seems to be. We see this same thing in the sections on holy relationship. In the ultimate sense, holy relationship is nothing more than accepting the Holy Spirit's purpose. It is not dependent on you and your spouse agreeing on holy purpose because ultimately there is just one mind. 
But a lot of the text on special and holy relationships is written at the level of the seeming split mind. For example, in the workbook, two minds with one intent become so strong that what they will become becomes the will of God. Workbook Lesson 185 And there is a passage in the text where he says, Whoever is saner at the time the threat is perceived should remember how deep in his indebtedness to the other and how much gratitude is due him and be glad that he can pay his debt by bringing happiness to both. Text chapter 18, section 5. This is obviously written as if there is a relationship between two people. These are helpful metaphors, while the mind seems to be split and believes in separate persons. At this stage, the world is not yet experienced as nothing but a world of ideas. Until there is a significant shift in the mind, it is experienced as relationships of bodies. Friend, is there a difference between teaching, which we all do by our thoughts and actions, and a teacher who seems to be able to verbalize and express concepts a little better, like you do? David I would say when you read the manual for teachers, just be aware of these different metaphors. At the beginning, he says that a teacher of God is anyone who wants to be one. Well, that is one way of talking about it. It is one that is often quoted. People will say, We are all teachers. But there is another metaphor in the Manual for Teachers as well. He cannot claim that title until he has gone through the workbook since we are learning within the framework of our course. Manual for Teachers, Section 16 To be a teacher of God you have to be teaching what comes through from the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you are seemingly teaching with God part of the time and teaching with the ego the rest of the time. That is why it is helpful when he uses all these educational metaphors. In the manual, he says, this about the teacher of God. Somewhere he has made a deliberate choice in which he did not see his interests as apart from someone else's. Once he has done that, his road is established and his direction is sure. Manual for Teachers, Section 1 There are only two lessons in your mind. The Holy Spirit is a lesson and the ego is a lesson. And if you continue to try to teach from both, you will be a conflicted teacher and a conflicted learner. It is a very confusing curriculum to try to teach two opposing thought systems that do not meet at any point. It gets back to the willingness to unveil the wrong mind. I cannot choose the Holy Spirit consistently until I see that the wrong mind has nothing to offer. I cannot choose the Holy Spirit as long as I think there are some parts of the wrong mind that are attractive. For example, Maybe I still believe that there is some good guilt. For most people, innocence is good. But there are certain hyenas crimes 
that are unacceptable. As long as you believe there are certain injustices and certain grievances that are valid, then you still believe in good guilt. The Course's message is that guilt is never good. Guilt always comes from the ego. Ultimately, it seems as if there is an ego, a Holy Spirit and a decision maker. But as long as you believe there is an autonomous decision maker that can choose one or the other, or at times neither, you are falling into another trap. You are always, every instant, either in the wrong mind or the right mind. In the rules for decision it says, Today I will make no decisions by myself. Text chapter 30, section 1 he says you may perceive this as coercion, but think about it. You have two advisors in your mind, and every decision you make comes from listening to one or the other. It is not a question of coercion here. He says you will make a decision based on one of these advisors. The purpose of the course is to take a look at what I really want. I cannot make a choice for the Holy Spirit as long as I believe there is something attractive about the ego. As soon as the ego gets raised up from the unconscious into conscious awareness, I can see that none of these beliefs serve me. That is it.